everyone. Dr. Brian Scott with you. This is Friday, and we're wrapping up another week of Insights to the End Times. We've been looking over the course of the last two and a half years at Bible scriptures, talking about the end days, the last days, the end of the age, where we are in God's timetable. We've also been looking at what's going on in the world, which, which um, basically define that we're in the last days and show us that we're in the last days. In fact, the world has a doomsday clock. And uh, that clock is to tell us how close we are to the end. And for the longest time, it's been somewhere in the 90 seconds to the end. I think we're under a minute now to the end of the time, of the age. And all of this is biblical because... Uh, uh, as we get closer to the end, we're going to head into the seven years of tribulation that wrap up the life on the, on the earth as we know it. This will be when the Antichrist is in control, or he purports to be in control of a good portion of the earth. And uh, he will bring evil and wickedness like you've never, ever imagined. In fact, they can't def you couldn't find the definition of his evil or wickedness in the dictionary because they haven't created the words for it yet. But at the same time, God's pouring out his wrath on the earth because the seven years of tribulation is for God to cleanse the earth of the evil and the sin to prepare it for the rule and reign of Jesus Christ for a thousand years. He comes back for the battle of Armageddon. I'm sure you've heard that term. Some people think uh, we may have already experienced it. Others think we're already in the tribulation. Well, the point of the, uh, the matter is this. Uh, we are leading up to it very quickly. And uh, we see the spirit of the Antichrist in the world today in every form and facet and shape and, and, and every area. Uh, we see what's going to happen at the Battle of Armageddon. People are, uh, things are going to be, it's going to be changed. Everything's going to be changed because Jesus is rising up. Well, in, uh, in Paul's writing to Timothy, he said two things that really stand out. His two books, you should study both Timothy's, first and second. They're outstanding uh, records of what's going on in the world, especially today. But in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Paul made this statement to Timothy. He said, in, in these latter days, in these latter times, you're going to see some, I'm adding the word believers, some believers who will depart from the faith, they will pay attention to or give heed to deceiving spirits, which are demonic, seducing spirits, which are demonic, and doctrines of demons, and that's demonic. So they're going to pay attention to a lot of delusional thinking, deceptive thinking, seductive thinking, et cetera, et cetera. We're seeing that everywhere. We're just seeing it absolutely everywhere. We've seen the, um, a style of life change, and uh, the world is shifting and changing and moving towards uh, a much uh, unrighteous world than it's ever been before. Jesus spoke of it in uh, Matthew 24. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be just before I'm coming. And in the days of Noah, Genesis 6 defines that as evil days, um, wicked days, confused days, and every intent of the heart was evil. So man's heart was tainted. We get to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, and Paul says, in the last days... Better know this, Timothy. Perilous times are coming. Perilous means exceedingly dangerous, like exceedingly dangerous. And uh, then he goes on to define some of the symptoms or signs of that or the perils of that. We've been studying them one by one. We've really been expanding them to pick up as much as we can from what's happening in the world to show us, hey, this is what we're living in right now. This isn't normal, folks. This isn't normal. This is what the world is uh, f falling into. So today we're in chapter 3, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 3, and we're at the very last of the signs in that verse. It's despisers of good. Amen. The verse reads, unloving, we covered that. Unforgiving, we've looked at that. Slanders, we've studied that. Without self-control, we know people like that. Brutal. We're seeing that everywhere in the world today. Um, and then despisers of good. So let me read a definition to you that I've uh, pulled together. Because all of these uh, terms that Paul's using are from a Greek source, a Greek word. 
and have been translated into English, but the original Greek meaning is usually much more expansive than the Canadian or the American or the English translation. So in this particular verse, the word despisers only appears this one time. It's an unusual and it's a rarely used word. It describes, now listen closely, it describes a land or a country or a nation where the laws and the regulations seem to primarily defend and protect those who are offending. I want to read that again because you, I don't want you to miss this. This word despisers of good in the Greek is a very, very rarely used word, but it describes a land, a nation, a country where the laws and regulations of that country seem to defend the offended, the one who is offending, and they seem to protect the one who is offending or committing the crime. And those who are, these are immoral and evil people, and they're the ones being protected rather than the people who are being offended or being attacked. So the rights of the innocent are being forgotten and the rights of the criminal, the offensive person, are being protected. That leaves the good people with no defense. <clears throat> Is that not what's happening in our courts today? Is that not, isn't that what's happening in, in the rule of law today? That even our judges are taking the law, looking at the social morals, mores of the day, the way things are shifting and changing. And they take and bend the law to support what's going on societal levels rather than going back to the actual legislation, the actual precedent and saying, oh, that's, you can't do that. You have no right to do that. So um, that seems to be the way it's going. We read about it every day. I read about it in this morning's newspaper before I came to the studio to record. I saw it again today that the courts uh, released individuals who had uh, been uh, charged with heinous, uh, horrible offenses. And, and the court said, uh, we'll set a, a trial date and it's usually six to eight to 10 or 12, 15 months away. And in the meantime, uh, we'll release you on bail. And here are the, here's the standards. Uh, don't go near these people. There's six of them. We want you to avoid them. And uh, da, 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 da. And that's like telling a kid, you can't do this. And what do they do within 10 minutes? They do that very thing. The human nature. <laughs> The human nature is to go against the rules and laws. Let's go back to the book of Genesis for just a minute. God creates everything. He creates this beautiful tree. It's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's in the middle of the garden. He says to Adam, his man that he created, in his own image and likeness, he says to Adam, you have the complete authority and control over everything that we've created except for one, one thing. You cannot touch one, one thing. Just one thing, that tree, do not eat its fruit. So the instructions are very clear. You, you have complete uh, uh, access to everything that has been created except for one tree. Do not go near the knowledge of the tree of, of um, good and evil. Don't go near the tree of good and evil. Don't eat its fruit. So. What exactly occurs, and that's in, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, the first couple of verses, what occurs? The serpent comes along to Eve and says, uh, that's not what God meant. That's not what the law meant. That's not what the rules mean. That's not what the government's rules mean. Here's what it means. And he tricks her. He seduces her. He deceives her into eating the fruit. She gives it to Adam. He eats the fruit, and the whole thing falls apart. And what's... The beauty of creation is now tainted by one three-letter word called sin, S-I-N. 
because they violated the law. That's what's going on. Despisers of good means in the land, the nation, or the country, the laws and the regulations are no longer abided by, but they are applied in a fashion to protect and defend those who are offending and breaking them, who are immoral and, and evil, rather than protecting the innocent good people. And so the good people are left without a defense. We're seeing this, as I said, all the time. And um, we're, we used to have a law system, a legal system that said you are innocent until we can prove you guilty. You are innocent until we can prove you guilty. And we have to do that beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, think about it. That's no longer the case. Uh, people are considered to be guilty until they can prove their innocence. And they can be accused of something without any supporting facts or evidence or statements or anything else. And they are immediately found to be guilty by social media. It's broadcast. It's slandered. It's, dis it's, it's all across the social media uh, forums. And everybody everywhere knows, hey, 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 this person is guilty of this. They haven't even been in a trial yet. There's never been any uh, evidence presented. Uh, the, the, uh, the person who's accusing has never been cross-examined. Oh, it's atrocious. So we see good citizens who are left in jeopardy. Our courts, it seems, are becoming more and more confused um, when it comes to things of a moral and ethical nature. Um, we no longer seem to be able to distinguish between what's right and what's wrong. These things that I'm speaking about all fall under the category of despisers of good. Now, when you see that and read that in, in the uh, Second Timothy, um, you're, th you're thinking such, I, I don't mean this disrespectfully, because I thought it myself, but we're thinking, oh, there's someone who doesn't like people who do good things. So they come against someone who, you know, is a Boy Scout to help uh, old ladies across the street. You know, that kind of uh, thinking. No, no, it goes way deeper than that. It's that the laws and the rules and the regulations of our society are no longer being applied uh, in the proper fashion. That, that what we have going on here, uh, it leaves the innocent people unprotected. So <clears throat> the victims suffer while the offender goes free. Um, it's, not, it's not difficult anymore to get someone off a charge. The, the lawyers, the, especially in the realm of criminal law, uh, have become very, very adept at uh, uh, being able to get their clients freed uh, from charges that have gone on. Can I take you on a little journey for a minute? My wife, we've been married a lot of years. We got married in university. I think, if I recall correctly, we just celebrated 51 years of uh, a marriage. She studied to become a teacher. Her dad was a teacher. Her mom was a teacher. Her sister was a teacher. She studied to become a teacher. And she not only obtained her bachelor degree from university, but she obtained a two degrees in education, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in education. She was a primary grade teacher for many years. That's the junior grades, grades one, two, three, four, that type of thing. So she was teaching the very youngest kids all the early standards that they should have for life. Um, she homeschooled our own kids for many years. And then she felt compelled to open a private school with very high standards, educational, moral, ethical standards, Christian standards. She was the principal and the founder of that school. It, uh, it had an 11 or 12 year um, existence and um, it was one of the best and strongest schools in our city. Now in that 11 or 12 year period that it existed, she saw such a change in the attitude of the parents and such uh, very strong support to begin with from the parents to uh, middling support later on. 
But she also saw in the educational system that we went uh, in our province of Ontario and probably far spread, more far spread than that. We went from promoting kids because they had passed and obtained the grades to be promoted to the next level, the next grade. We went from that to, oh, we don't want to hurt little Johnny's feelings. We don't want to hurt little Mary's self-esteem. We want them to have a good th feeling about themselves. So we don't want to use the word failure. We want to promote them no matter what. And as they go on, they'll get a hold of things and everything will turn out all right. So we started to see in the school system that kids were being promoted who could not read or write or do anything of that nature. They didn't, in the old system, they would not have passed. They would have failed. But in the new system, oh, we, we are more concerned with their self-esteem and their self-values and their self-awareness and their self-worth. We, we don't want to hold them back because they can't spell the word, you know, Mississippi. Anyways, what I'm getting at is we removed responsibility from children. They no longer had to be responsible for anything. They could just float down the river and everything would be fine. That, to me, seems to be what's happened in our society, that no one takes responsibility anymore. Everyone just floats down the river. So if you happen to offend someone or commit a crime or do something that's against the law, oh, I know you didn't mean it, so we'll just give you a little slap on the hand and we'll let you go. Well, in the early stages of that, that's pretty mi minor and benign, but folks, uh, cancer starts off as a very small little, you know, destruction of a cell, but it grows into a major one and it causes a lot of people to go through uh, horrible, horrible issues. And finally, they end up losing that fight and they die. That's what's happened to our society. Our society has changed. Standards no longer exist the way they used to. Anything goes and you can say anything you want to. And I can't say anything against you because if I do, I'm discriminating against you. Oh, my gracious. I'm the one who gets punished for asking you to be polite, et cetera, et cetera. When I was a lawyer practicing, I went to close a real estate deal one day. And the lawyer that I was working with was someone I had known for many years. And uh, we were fairly good acquaintances. I wouldn't say we're necessarily friends, but good acquaintances. And we're standing side by side at the registrar's desk, exchanging all the paperwork that's necessary in a home real estate transaction. And this lawyer just continued to swear all the way through the exchange of things. And he was, it was just, I found it offensive. Now, this is back in the early 1980s, I would say. So I turned to him, I asked him the question, how many years of university training have you had? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, how many years? He said, well, you know, law school is three years, and, and, and then we have to go through articles is a year, and we have to go to the bar admin course as a year, roughly speaking, and, and then university is either three or four years. So I've, you know, I got seven years. I said, for, with someone with seven years of higher education, that's the best you can speak? Like, you don't know any other words than swear words? That's the best you can speak? You should be ashamed of yourself. Um, he turned to me and said, I am sorry. I did not know I was doing that. I apologize to you. And from that time on, over the next 15 years of our working together, I never, ever heard him use a bad word again. Do you think I could get away with that today? I would be discriminating. I would be up on charges of some description under the Human Rights Code or something. Um, it, it is, it's just amazing to me, unbelievable to me. We, we don't want to hurt a person's feelings. So we've got all kinds of things going on in our society today uh, that uh, the, the, the government has shifted and changed and moved us away from, from things. And they have created rules and laws that violate their, per, their own previous rules and laws. So now, where do we stand? We don't even know anymore. Can we say this? Can we say that? Can we do this? Can we do that? Because now what we consider to be biblical standards are no longer government standards or country standards or national standards. We are living in a time of despisers of good. 
See you next week. Hope you'll be back. Call you blessed. Amen.